Information flow. 
Okay. So that's a really amazing thing. Because now, it doesn't really matter what the physical problem is. All problems can be looked at it in this way. Okay. Now, fast forward, 1948 to now, 60 years later, all communication systems are now designed by the principles of information theory. It becomes a benchmark for comparing different schemes and different channels. So I want to emphasize that the information theory not only gives you a benchmark for comparing different schemes. That's pretty obvious. You design scheme A, scheme B, and try to compare the capacity and see how far you are. If you are too far away, they try to improve it. If you are very close, they don't bother. that. That is a pretty standard way of using information theory. But also, it is, can be used for comparing different channels, for example. So you are building a you build a channel, okay, and then you compute the capacity, and then now you say, okay, maybe I have an alternative design to change my channel. Then the capacity becomes a good benchmark because it allows you to evaluate how much improvement you can get in terms of your physical device, in terms of how you can improve the capacity. One very good example of this is precisely MIMO. In fact, the idea of MIMO came about, well, the, came about was precisely because people found that the information theoretic capacity of MIMO system is really much higher than a single input, single output system, and thereby increases people's interest in MIMO a whole lot. And three, not only is a benchmark, it actually suggests totally new ways of communication. So, when you design a communication system, engineers typically have certain insights or intuition about how to communicate over that physical medium. Okay? Information theory looks at the problem from a basic point of view, and sometimes the mathematical result you derive as a result of the information theoretic analysis gives you a totally different way of communication. Totally different way of communication. And that has happened over and over again. In the field that I worked on, wireless communication, that has happened two or three times, multiple times already. And uh, it has happened in other fields as well. Okay. So now we step back and say, well, what is the secret of success of information theory? Why is information theory so successful? Uh, so I distilled the uh, information theory into three points, three points which I think is important. The first point I want to mention is that information theory focuses on information and then computation. Okay? Now, in this day and age, this is a very strange ordering of the situation. Because in this day and age, if you go and look at you know, any uh, field, the first thing they're concerned about is computation. Okay? How do I design algorithms to solve this problem? This is a very natural thing, right? So as I was chatting with Mathieu, biologists have a lot of concern. They want to compute things. So the first thing to look at is computation, and then for the first person to talk to are computer scientists, not information theorists. Okay? However, Shannon took an opposite point of view. He says, what is the minimal amount of information you need to compute or a certain task without regard to the complexity of the computational problem? First, he established that benchmark. And then he worked hard, and he and others worked hard, in trying to come up with efficient algorithm to get to the information limit. Well, okay, all right. It took us quite a long time, only 60 years, but we got there. The magical thing is we actually got there. Because you think about the communication problem from a complexity point of view. A lot of the problems you would formulate, like nearest neighbor decoding, etc., are typically empty hard problems. <clears throat> and then you'll get very discouraged. You'll say, forget it, these problems are too hard, let's not worry about it. By not looking at complexity, Shannon, in some sense, well, Shannon didn't know much about complexity probably, but by not looking at it, in some sense, he got lucky. Because now you've got this information theory limit. <coughs> and once you have the limit, because those limits are asymptotic, <coughs> there are many now different ways of approaching those limits, and many of those ways are computationally efficient. So that was a good thing. So, second point I want to make is that we start with simple models and then we make it more complicated. Okay? So a, a good example of a simple model is our favorite discrete memoryless channel. Okay, 
you do think of a discrete member's channel, all I can say is that it is like the Holy Roman Empire. Hey folks, you know what the Holy Roman Empire is? Exactly, the Holy Roman Empire is not holy, nor was it Roman. <laughs> and at the end of the day, at the end of the empire, it wasn't an empire even. So this is like the discrete members channel, because in the real world, think about television, radio, the applications we talked about earlier, they're hardly discrete. Okay, you're dealing with analog signals here. They're hardly memorless. Most channels have, say, in the simple interference, multicast, etc. And okay, this is a channel. So it's not exactly like the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> but nevertheless, Shannon was very brave. You think about it, he was very brave. Why? Because in those days, 1948, think about it. Everyone was worried about how to make television work, how to make radios work, how to make wide line tele tele telephone work. And then he proposes this model, which seemingly has nothing to do with reality. And yet he's telling people that this is what you should be looking at. And once you understand this, then you can understand your more complicated model. That was very brave. Okay. Number three is infinity and then back. Okay. So you start with looking at the problem at the asymptotic limit. Asymptotic limit. Okay. Not exactly infinite block in, but finite but very, very long block in. And then he says, okay, when you actually design a system, then you go back and design a system. But the asymptotic limit seems to be a very good description or give a lot of insights about the finite system. So what is the value of this approach? The value of this approach is really allows you to think, as Sergio already said, in terms of typical behavior. Because we're dealing with probabilistic system here, there are many ways in which things can happen. There are many ways in which things can go wrong. But the typical behavior tells you that essentially you need to identify one way, which is sort of the typical way. And once you understand that, that allows you to analyze the system much better. Okay, now, this infinity notion, as uh, Sergio said, has a lot of complaints. People say, this is dealing with infinite code word. These guys are mathematicians sitting around. So for that, I have only one response. The one response is the following. Asymptotic limit can be thought of as the first term in a Taylor series expansion of infinity. So that's the point, right? Is that if you want to solve a problem, then you first want to solve the first order version of the problem. Once you solve that, then you can add second order term, third order term. And therefore, theory is the first term in the Taylor series of practice. Okay, I didn't say that. Uh, Tom Corbett said that. It's very sad that he's not with us anymore, but words that he said, I understand. Okay. All right. So now we look forward. Okay. So, we learn our lessons, and now the question is, is there any other fields for which we can broaden our way of this way of thinking, so that we can perhaps achieve success that we achieve in communication? So that's the question I'm after. Okay? Now, if you look at this question, you may say, oh, okay, okay, okay. So let me try to, we have a bunch of theorems there, we have a bunch of theorems that we prove in information theory. Let's find somewhere to apply these theorems and get success. Okay? That would be more like what Sergio said, which is, you have a hammer, and then you go around and try to find the nails to use a hammer. That is not what we should be doing, folks. What we should be doing, I think, is that we are learning the broad philosophy, the three points I mentioned, for example. And we try to apply this broader philosophy to solve other problems. That would be much more powerful way of thinking, <coughs> as opposed to just applying the specific terms. <coughs> okay, so recently I've tried to do that. In the past year and a half, I've been thinking about problem, and this problem is what I want to share with you. So this is a problem in a field called high throughput shotgun sequencing. And the problem is very simple. The problem is the following. And DNA is the blueprint of life. Okay? So in every cell of our body, there is a 
sequence, the DNA sequence. And this DNA sequence you can think of as coming from a four letter alphabet. Okay? And this sequence is about three billion uh, symbols long. Okay? Each symbol is called a nucleotide. nucleotide. And the problem is simply that we want to obtain the sequence. Because this sequence contains almost a lot of the information about life. And once we get the sequence, then we can go down the chain and process this information. So in some sense, the first step of um, biology and medicine nowadays is essentially get the sequence. Once you get the sequence, you can do many, many different things. So this is a pretty basic problem. And uh, the impetus of this problem comes from the Human Genome Project. This project took 13 years. Took 13 years. Uh, as I said, you want to sequence 3 billion nucleotides. It costs about $3 billion. So, $1 per nucleotide. Okay. All right. And by the way, this $1 is your dollar and my dollar. It's taxpayer dollars, actually. All right. Okay. Uh, fortunately for us, the funny thing happened is that the Human Genome Project cost $3 billion to sequence one human genome. But the price drops like a rock. Okay. So if this is the price as a function of time of cost per genome, sequencing a genome, and this is Moore's law. So there's nothing much that is faster than Moore's law, decreasing faster than Moore's law, and this is one good example of that. So right now, sequencing uh, costs about a few thousand dollars. So going from billions to a few thousand, that is a good thing. That means now we can actually sequence at a much larger scale. Okay, and therefore this problem becomes more and more um, important. And also the time of sequence one genome have gone down from years to of the order of days and hopefully eventually to hours and so forth. And the consequence of that, all that is based on massive parallelization, which I'll mention a little bit later on. Okay. Now it's exciting. We have this technology is it's, it's getting cheaper, but at the same time we have many genomes to sequence. So, for example, you have about 100 million species. Most species have not been sequenced at all. And it's important to understand, to sequence these spe as many species as we can, because we want to sort of build, for example, a phylogenetic tree. This is a tree of life. It shows the relationship between different species, how evolution occurs, how mutation occurs. And understanding this tree, also helps us to understand individual species like human. Okay. Within, say, a species, one also wants to worry about sequencing individual, uh, separate individuals. Because it turns out that different individuals have different DNA sequence. Now, it's not very different, for example, humans. It differs by about 0.1%. So only 0.1% of that very long strain is different. But the differences are very important. For example, some, a majority of those differences come from so-called SNP. So this is not SNP index. <laughs> this is single, I should remember this because I'm working this biology stuff, right? Single nucleotide polymer phrase. Okay. Uh, this is one thing I find a little bit difficult for me in biology. is that you have all these terms that you're supposed to remember, but you don't. So that's a bit of a problem. It doesn't sound very convincing to people who don't remember these names. But I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. And uh, the one vision here is that eventually one day the, the technology will be so good, so cheap, so fast that we can sequence any, every individual when they're born. And potentially you can sequence them as they grow in life. So as to get a good diagnosis of the potential disease that they can get. So these SNPs precisely are markers, indicators of potential diseases or likelihood to diseases that individuals can get. Within a single human, within a single individual, there are 10 to the 13 cells. And it turns out that some of these cells, the DNA are also different. So this is a so-called somatic mutation. So in diseases like cancer, it is really a disease of the genome. Okay? So cancer cells that has DNA which is different from normal cells. And the differences gives you a clue 
of how to treat that particular cancer. So therefore, this is very important information. Nowadays, when we treat cancer, it's very crude because you essentially apply the hammer to essentially many, many different variation of the cancer, you still apply the hammer. And so as a result, they were very crude treatment. So you want to have a much more refined way of treating diseases like cancer. And the clue to that could be through the DNA sequence. So you can see that there are many, many broad applications for this technology. And so we want to understand this technology better. And by understanding this better, perhaps it will help in some of these applications. So let me now talk about the engineering problem. So this sequencing problem is an engineering problem. Okay? Biology is the application of this problem, but it's an engineering problem. So we're engineers, it's good to look at engineering problems. Okay, so I have this 3 billion long genome. I use the symbol G to dictate this length, G for genome, static notation actually. So it turns out that what happens when you do sequencing is the so-called short gun sequencing. This is the dominant method by which people do gene sequencing. Okay, so what they do is they basically chop up this DNA sequence into many, many short fragments. Okay? So these short fragments are so-called reads. Okay? And each read is of the length of the order of maybe a few tens to a few hundred. Okay? Read kind of short, especially compared to this total length. And you, but you get lots and lots of them. Okay? So basically what happens in the lab is that you are essentially have many, many copies of the DNA, right? Your many cells, for example. And then you extract these reads in parallel. Okay? And it is this parallelization which speed up the process. Okay? And because of limitation of the chemical process, you can only essentially get a short fragment at a time. Okay? However, the good thing is that because you do all these in parallel, these fragments are randomly located, and therefore many of them will be overlapping. And it is the overlap which is going to help us to put things together. Are you getting this from one strand or from both of them? Uh, in practice, of course, it's going to be from both of them. Yes. Do you have a sense of direction? Or? Yeah, so that is a variation on this problem. <coughs> so in this formulation I'm going to talk about, it's just going to be, you know the direction. But in practice, you may not know the direction. It turns out that our theory can extend to that case as well. But to simplify the description in the, in the, uh, in the, in the um, spirit of the discrete members channel, we will look at a single strand only. So, okay. So, sorry, the, the reads are, you always know whether it's the, the read or the complement, because there is a complement. Right? Yeah, that's exactly the question oh, that we have. This is the same question. Oh, okay. The complement is the other strand. So in practice, you do not know. You have to worry about it. Uh, but I'm not going to worry about it here. So you can extend the analysis to that case as well. It turns out it, it doesn't change the result that I'm going to talk about. OK, all right. So this problem, that's why it's called the assembly problem. OK, so the reads are assembled together to reconstruct the original DNA sequence. This is the genome. Shotgun sequencing assembly problem. Okay? Now, this is a cool problem. <laughs> all of us have tried to solve this kind of problem before when we were kids. Okay? We have a jigsaw puzzle. It has, well, it's a bit exaggeration. It's not 3 billion pieces, but it's like a few hundred million pieces. And you try to put them together, it takes some effort. So here we have four crazy scientists here trying to work on this problem. All right. Now, let's look at the current situation in terms of the field. As I mentioned, that the growth, the, the cost of sequencing has gone down like a rock. And one reason is now because when we look back at the early era of sequencing, the Human Genome Project, there's basically one technology called the Sanger technology. Okay? Um, actually, Sanger won a Nobel Prize for this technology. Okay? So there's a Nobel Prize winning work which was very important in the 70s, in the 70s, I believe. Mean. But nowadays, there are multiple <coughs> technologies, okay? Uh, about five or six of them, I would say, okay? And basically, they're competing with each other, okay? So with competition, you have progress, that's good. Now, each technology is kind of different because they have different read lengths. For example, 
Illumina is a short read, specialized in short reads. Uh, the story was about of the order of uh, 30, 40 uh, nucleotide reads. Nowadays, they're going up to 100 to 200 reads. Uh, PacBio, PacBio is actually a company down the street here. Uh, that's one thing good about this area is that uh, there are many companies down the street. <laughs> Uh, Pack Bio is a company down the street, and the reads are of the order of a few thousand, two or three thousand. Okay, the longer reads. However, they have longer reads, but they have they are much more noisy. Whereas the Illumina have shorter reads, but they're cleaner. So now you have a situation which is a little bit like um, communication, right? You have multiple technologies, and you sort of try to understand. Okay, so which one is better than the other one? Or under what condition this one is more useful? People kind of a little bit confused about that, and. Uh, so you can see that the view is becoming sort of a barbican. Okay, now there are many technologies and there are many more assembly algorithms. So if you go to Wikipedia, you go to Wikipedia, and this is a list of all the assemblers available. So these are software that people write, okay? They are in general based on different algorithms. Some are variation of each other, but nevertheless, you have quite a few of them. Actually, that's not all. There's another, <laughs> another, another half a page. And uh, kind of it, it, there's a grand total of 42 assemblers. 42 assemblers. Now, if you want to look at a field where a theory could potentially be useful, this could be such a field. The reason is the following. If you think about it, in, say, data compression, our whole field here, how many algorithms are there that people use? It's not 42. It's not like every time you want to compress a file, you say, hey, here's 42 possible options for you to choose from. No, you don't do that. There's Lambo Zip, okay? And maybe there's a Barrow's Wheel of Transform, okay? You know, two or three algorithms, or context tree weighting. Maybe two or three algorithms, basically dominated by Lambo Zip, though, however. So it shows that people really have a good understanding of this problem, and therefore there's no need to have 40 algorithms to compete with each other. The fact that there are 42 algorithms suggests to me that there is something uh, sort of fundamental understanding of the script that is perhaps missing, thereby creating this portfolio of algorithms. <coughs> In particular, we want to ask just a basic question. Why is there no single optimal algorithm? Okay. Now, you may argue that, oh, that's because there are different applications, because there are different technologies. But perhaps if we understood the problem enough, we could have a single algorithm, and for different technology, we can substitute different parameters of the algorithm. <coughs> right? If we understood the problem really deep enough. We don't at this point, obviously. Okay, so our research so started with asking this question. And uh, so the basic question is if you want to talk about optimality, what's the first thing you need to have? A metric. <laughs> a metric, right? Okay, so here's a metric that an information theorist would naturally ask, which is, what is the minimal number of reads required for reconstruction? So you're doing this process of extracting reads from the DNA sequence. The time of this extraction process is roughly proportional to the number of reads you need to extract. Okay? So in other words, if you need 100 million reads, and you can reduce it to 50 million reads, then you can save your uh, time from one day to half a day. Okay? <coughs> so roughly it's proportional to the number of So this is a data requirement question. So this seems like a very natural question. Okay? Once you have this question, then you can define what an optimal algorithm is. An optimal algorithm is one that achieves this minimum. That's it. Okay? Um, so once you have this algorithm, as we know, then now you have a benchmark for comparing different algorithms. So now I can go and look at those 42 algorithms and try to figure out which one is close and which one's far away from the fundamental limit. Yes? What are the constraints in fitting them together? What is the constraint in fitting them together? Okay. If you're trying to optimize something, the underwater constraint. The goal, right? So you have an original sequence, yeah? DNA sequence. This is the ground truth. You want to know what that ground truth is. But all you obtain are these very short reads, many of them, but you don't know what the ground truth is. So your measure of success is that you can reconstruct the ground truth. But now, 
I want to minimize the amount of data I need to reconstruct the drive through. And I want to know what that minimum is. Okay? All right. Surprisingly, this problem, seemingly basic, is rather open. We searched and searched on the literature, could not find a clear answer to this question. Okay. However, there are people who have been thinking about this problem. Okay. So I look at Matthew, and then I see that his colleague at MIT is right there, Eric Lander. So Eric Lander is the first author of the human genome um, paper. So a very important person, very influential person. His friend, Waterman, they're also very important. So they wrote a paper in the late 80s, just before the start of the Human Genome Project. They said, OK, uh, I want to know the answer to this question, which is, what is the minimum number of reads I need to ensure that there is no gap between the reads with the desired product? Okay. So this is a question of coverage. They say, OK, well, I want the reads to cover my DNA sequence. And I want to know what's the probability, okay? So suppose I want with probability 99% that I'll cover the sequence. How many reads do I need? Okay? So this question, you can look at almost any uh, undergraduate discrete math course, one of the things I taught at Berkeley. And then you can compute this answer. It's basically a, a favorite problem for uh, the street map is called the coupon collector problem. Okay? So the number of reads is given by g, the length of the genome, divided by l, the length of the read, log g over epsilon, where epsilon is the failure probability, say 1% failure probability. Okay, this is the basic coupon collection problem. Uh, notice that uh, if the reads were placed in a very strategic place, that's exactly uh, adjacent to each other, then you will need g over l of them to cover the whole thing, right? But because you're randomly placing them, you pay a penalty, and that penalty is given by this long term. Okay, this is basic calculation. What I want to say though, what I want to say though, is that this question does not answer our question. I, I just want to be clear here, very clear, because we can ask this Quite a bit. They say, hey, didn't Linda what we already solve your problem? They said, yes, they're famous, but they haven't solved our problem. Okay. What about Gene Meyer? He used to be a colleague, right? He's Gene somebody, Meyer. He's somebody big uh, Gene Meyer, Meyer did not work with. Uh, okay, so Gene Meyer designed. Oh, so, so what about Gene Meyer? Like he's supposed to be a big shot. No, 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 but he's supposed to be the big shot in shotgun sequencing. So, okay. So he was, he wrote a paper in the mid 90s advocating for shotgun sequencing for the Human Genome Project. Those days, people were going on a different path. They were not doing shotgun sequencing for the whole genome. Okay? Shotgun sequencing was only done for a very short genome in those days in the 90s. He was advocating doing it for the whole thing. And then the only person who paid attention was the founder of Solera. Right? No, my understanding Craig, is... Craig Winter. Craig yeah, Winter. But his, his, his background is in CS and he did algorithms for short yeah, he, he actually did a lot on a problem that David didn't mention at the repetition. There are a lot of repeats in the, yeah, in the I, genome. And he suggested some improvements. That's why there are so many algorithms, because there are a lot of repeats. And then you don't know if you just got to read 10 times for that region, or is it repeated? Right. The repeats so are coming. coming. <laughs> the repeats are coming. Has it, has it arrived? Yet? OK. They're a patient here. All right, so what I want to say is that the reason why Ben can ask was Jim Meyer was a colleague of ours for only two years now, unfortunately. I wish I, actually, I wish I had talked to him when he was here for a short time because then I would learn about this problem 10 years earlier. Okay. Um, so what I want to say is that if you want to reconstruct the sequence, then at least you want to be able to cover the sequence. If you can't cover the sequence, you cannot reconstruct. So what this number n, what this G over L log Q, it's, not, it's really a low bound on the number of reads. Okay? So it's a low bound. We all agree on that. But what I'm interested in is, is this band tight? In other words, is there actually some algorithm that can actually attain this low bound? Or is this low bound loose and therefore we should get a better low bound? We don't know the answer to that question, and that's what we want to investigate. Okay, so it turns out there's a pretty nice analogy 
between the communication problem and the sequencing problem. So let's go back to our figure one again. So this is our figure one for communication. And the key result by Shannon, a, a reminder, is the capacity over the entropy is the maximum communication rate. Okay. Remember that this is an asymptotic result. Asymptotic result. Okay. Sequencing has a figure one as well. So this is the figure one of sequencing. We have the genome sequence, which we try to figure out. So think of this as the source data, data source. I have a physical sequencing <coughs> process. Okay, so different companies have different <coughs> sequencing process. I don't care. I think of it as a channel. Everybody has a different channel. I extract a sequence of reads, R1 up to Rn, the N reads, each of which is a, say, 100 nucleotide long vector. <coughs> and then I put them together. So each of these guys can be thought of as a channel output. Channel output. Okay. The assembly try to put together to reconstruct the original sequence. What's so the natural the, time index for the reads? Sorry? What's the natural time index for the reads? Uh, time index is not very important here because remember I'm extracting all these things in parallel. But there's some location along the genome or something? No, no, no. Okay. <coughs> so I haven't talked about the model yet. But these, uh, time, these indexes are not time. They're just a, a set of reads. So just a set? Yeah, yeah. just a set of reads. <coughs> okay. Right. So then it seems to me to be natural following information theory, or following communication, I should say more precisely, to define this notion called the sequencing rate, okay? Which is the ratio of G over N. G over N. Where is G over N? G is the length of the DNA sequence, N is the number of channel uses. So G over N is precisely the analogy of communication rate. It tells me how many DNA symbols or nucleotide can I resolve per read on the average after looking at many reads and a very long DNA sequence. If I'm interested in minimizing the number of reads, it is analogous to maximizing the sequencing rate. And that's what communication people like to do, they want to maximize the rate. So then the question would be, what is the maximum sequencing rate R such that reliable reconstruction is asymptotically yeah. So the read length is not important here? The read length is of course important. The read length will be a parameter of the channel. <coughs> right? So, the, uh, your question is very good because it brings an important point that I want to emphasize. Is that one sort of way of thinking of a problem people think of is that each channel output is a nucleotide. It's a channel output. But no. I want to think of the whole read as a channel output. Because the value of a read is knowing what is the contiguous segment of the, of the whole thing. You give me just individual nucleotide, it provides no information to me only whatsoever because I can't really put them together. So the read is the channel output, not each nucleotide. And the length of the read is a parameter of the channel, therefore. Okay, so I want to say something about the differences with classic communication. So the way I have it, it seems like these two problems are an analogous, and therefore any theorem from the first problem can be directly applied to of my problem, and I can close shop. And uh, you know, we like to do some, we like to solve real important problems. We, like, we want to do some math too, and we want to show people that our math is not completely uh, trivial. So, um, so here's the argument. So this is the uh, DNA sequencing problem. <coughs> If you compare it to the communication problem that we're familiar with, there are two differences. Okay? The number one is that there is no encoder here. Okay? So no one is going to process my DNA sequence and then pass it through a channel in a, in a clever way. So therefore, there is really no source channel separation because it is the encoder which allows you to separate out the source and the channel. And therefore, whatever I do here is essentially a joint source channel problem. The source and channel are naturally binding together. In other words, whatever result I get here will be a function of both the source and the channel. And I can't really separate out very easily. Okay? Number two is that each channel output 
depends statistically on the whole source sequence. This is unlike most problems we find in communication, where a channel output typically depends only locally on what happens on the input. Okay? So even if there's memory, the memory is typically only local. For example, some Markov, etc. But this is very global because each read is extract, extracted from the whole sequence. So let's look clearly in the next slide why that is the case. However, what I want to emphasize is that despite the differences, we will show that the maximum information rate and sequencing capacity can be defined, exist, and can actually be characterized for some models. Okay. Sequencing capacity. All right. Okay, let's look at our channel. Our channel is a rather interesting channel here. So let's look at the channel. We have a DNA sequence G. Okay. What is this channel? It takes a random substring of length L and it outputs to the assembly. Okay. So this is the channel. So that's why I say that the channel output depends on the whole string because this substring is randomly selected from the whole string. Okay? Now, of course, as I mentioned, that there's also noise in the process, typically. So for example, this A may not become A, it may become a G. There is noise. But even I throw away that noise effect, let's assume that there is no noise. There's still a lot of randomness in the problem because this substring, I have no idea where it comes from. So that now, this connects to Van Kast, one of Van Kast's favorite problem, which is information is conveyed through position. So here, the information that I really want to figure out is precisely the position of this thing. Okay. So given that, yes? The length of the read fixed? The length of the read is fixed in my basic model. In practice, L could be a random variable. Okay, for example, for say pack bio, L typically is an exponentially distributed random variable. For other technology, it's more fixed. But we want to go into the most simple model. So we can close that. Yeah. Yes? So I was just wondering, so in your model, you select uh, substring aberrant, <coughs> like uniform from all substring. Yeah, I haven't really specified my model mathematically yet, but that's where I'm going, yes. Yeah, so, okay, I was just going to ask how accurate that is. Uh, okay, right. So, uh, so in <coughs> practice, there are some correlation <coughs> because th there is some correlation actually between the location of the read and the content of the string. So some substrings are more easily fragmented and therefore it's more likely to have read over there. So there will be some correlation. Uh, but to a first order of cross-pressure, I think randomness uh, people seem reasonably happy about it. Uh, so we're going to understand this first, and then we're going to add correlation. So we're going to go from the simple to the more complicated. But I think the random sort of captures the fact that um, this we can really be a, a lot of places, a lot of places. So before we investigate what the expression for the capacity is for some specific model, let us think intuitively, quantitatively, what the capacity would depend on. So now is the time for audience participation. Okay, so we have uh, some parameters here. Let, let us understand how the capacity depends on the read length L. If I increase the read length L, what do you think will happen to the sequencing capacity? Is it better or worse? Okay, I'm guess it's getting impatient, but I'm trying to throw away question to get the, get the audience warmed up here. If L increases, what happens to the capacity? Increases, right? Okay. So I think uh, since this is a summer school, let me throw in a few uh, professorial comment here. Is that sometimes before you investigate, before you actually do the math, do the details of the math, and find out the exact answer, it's good to get some intuitive feel of you know how the dependency should work, so that when you actually get an answer, you can do a sanity check. Because most of the time, you know, the first answer you get to any problem. There's a theorem here, meta theorem. <laughs> Most of the time, the first answer you get to a, a question is usually wrong. <laughs> yes. The right question here is actually the complexity of reconstruction, right? So when L increases, it's not clear. That's monotone. 
I mean, this is like a theoretical question about... Now, now, now Van Cat is already <laughs> saying... Uh, Van Cat is forgetting Shannon's lesson, though. <laughs> Remember what I said at the very beginning? Shannon said, information before... No, information then computation. So I'm subscribing to that, right? Because the formulation is information. We'll, tr we'll, we'll talk about complexity when we actually have an algorithm out there. And we'll see what happens. Okay. All right. So the DNA length, G, is another parameter. So what do you think? If G increases, what happens to the capacity? Decreases. So this is kind of different from classical information theory problems. Because classical information theory, the capacity typically does not depend on how long your source string is. Right? Never happened. It, never happened. But it does happen in this problem. So to fix this complication, and which is a deviation from classical information theory, we have to be a little bit more clever. And instead of defining, thinking about really L and G separately, it turns out <coughs> that what we should be looking at is a parameter, what we call normalized relay, which is defined in terms of L and G, which is L over log G. So you can see that the dependency in the right direction here. Okay, as G increases, this L bar is reduced. Um, let's look at an example. Genome, our DNA sequence 3 billion, L equals 100, L bar will be 4.6. So this L bar is, uh, is called a normalized parameter, but it's also pretty much numerically normalized because it's a number around one. It's not like 0 0.0001, or it's not like a billion. Okay? All right. So, we're going to start, yes? So, L bar is a channel parameter here, right? L bar is a channel parameter. Yes, it, exactly. It depends on the length of the source sequence as well. I mean, because it's, it's different from the classical, you know, channel characterization, yes, yes. you cannot have it. Yes, exactly. Good point. Thank you. Okay, so uh, here's our approach. We're going to follow Shannon, and we're going to start with a simple model. This simple model is totally unrealistic. If I give this talk in uh, a computational biology uh, conference, people will laugh me off the stage. I couldn't even get through, through the first slide. But since you guys are a captive audience, <laughs> you have no choice, but you have to go through my first slide. And uh, so we start a simple model, and we will see Somewhat surprisingly, this simple model has actually some predictive power for real data. And uh, so let, let's, start, let's be a bit patient here and go from a simple model. So the simple model is, of course, <coughs> memoryless, right? It's the simplest possible model for the DNA sequence is IND with distribution P. So think about the model, right? Shannon tells us that we should be putting statistical model on the various objects that we're dealing with. So I'm putting a statistical model on a DNA sequence. With a model, I can't really say, uh, I can't really tell you what the, the difficulty of reconstruction problem is. Okay. The positions of the read are ID, uniform on the DNA sequence. This is already mentioned in the question. Okay. And I'll assume the read process is noiseless. Okay. Now, this noiseless model doesn't seem very good. Okay. However, it turns out that in several of the technologies like Illumina, the noise rate is around 1%. So it's not like a huge amount of noise that we're dealing with here. So in order to focus on the interesting aspect of this problem, which is the fact that the reads are randomly located, I want to first of all assume the noise away. I'll come back to this noise issue a little bit at the end, but there's still a lot of open problems in this direction. So we will start with this model, and then we'll look at some data and see what this model says compared to the data. Okay. All right, so here's the result. Here is the sequencing capacity. So let's look at the uh, x-axis and the y-axis. The x-axis is my normalized read length parameter. The y-axis is the capacity. So this result says that below a certain threshold, the capacity is zero. Above a certain threshold, the capacity is just equal to L1. That's it. That's our theorem. I'll put an I in one. Okay? So, um, this number, H2P, is log of sum of pi squared minus about. Okay. And people are familiar with this. This is called the Rene entropy of order 2. Okay. So this is not Shannon entropy, but it is a measure, it is also a measure of how random things are, a different measure, not Shannon entropy. Okay? So 
Uh, in fact, there is no separation here. In other words, the capacity is not a ratio of something that de 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 depends on the channel and something that depends on the source. However, the source statistics, at least in the ID case, does enter into the picture in a simple way. Only through one number, which is 2 over this number. Okay, so now a question for you. If I increase the entropy, if I increase the entropy of the source string, the DNA string, is the capacity better or worse or undetermined? Okay, so let's look at this curve. If I increase the entropy, what happens to this threshold? It goes towards the left or right? Yeah. The left, okay. If it goes towards the left, what will happen to this line? It will extend further. So the capacity is better or worse? Better. So the more the entropy, the easier the problem is. This is actually quite bizarre. Okay, so let's look at the picture again. So, we have two images here. This one, as everyone agrees, whatever entropy measure you use is low entropy. This one is high entropy. Okay? So this picture will be easier to communicate because you need fewer bits to compress it. This picture will be hard to communicate. But if you think about this as a jigsaw puzzle, it's a harder jigsaw puzzle. If you think of this as a jigsaw puzzle, this is the easier jigsaw puzzle. So that's exactly what's happening here. Is that the measure of complexity, which we think of as entropy, okay, is actually in the eyes of the beholder. In other words, in how you want to use it for. Okay? Alright. So we're dealing with the jigsaw puzzle here, and therefore the lower the entropy is, in the sense precisely measured by that theorem, the harder the jigsaw puzzle. Alright, so let me say a few words about uh, what, why the capacity looks like that. First of all, this line is a very interesting line. This line is precisely, if you do the math, the coverage constraint. So Lambda and Waterman reappears in this figure. Because Lambda and Waterman tells me that this is a lower bound to the number of weeks, and therefore this line is an upper bound to the capacity curve. Right? So at least I did not violate Blender and Waterman. That would not be very nice. Blender, uh, Eric Blender is a very popular person. I want to contradict him. However, what we say is that the actual capacity is actually below this line in a very precise way. Is that below a certain threshold, you get nothing. But above it, you get back to the coverage constraint. Okay? All right. So now I'm, I'm getting a little bit worried here because as uh, I, by the way, I only started at uh, 11.45, I believe. You can have a few more minutes. <laughs> it's okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So I have 15 more minutes, right? At least, yeah? Okay, good. All right. So this line is precisely uh, coverage. So what is this line here? So this line is another fundamental limit, it turns out. So it turns out that this line is essentially a condition for which this sequence, this situation doesn't happen. So it turns out that in another context, it was proved by some guy, Nicole, that if you have this situation, so L is the read length, if you have four sequences with a pair of repeat here and a pair of repeat here of length L minus one, then no matter what, how many reads you get, this x and y can be interchanged and you can't tell the difference. Because the reads are basically length L, and therefore it cannot connect one side to another side. And therefore you have no feeling of whether it's x or y. So this is a, um, what you want does the calculation. This turns out to be a low bound as well. So this is kind of a pretty clear low bound. It's not very difficult. This coverage is definitely not difficult. So our contribution really is, is that these two natural necessary conditions is also sufficient. In other words, you can reconstruct the sequence if these two bad things don't happen. Yes. So your, your notion of reconstruction appears to be exact then, right? So let's say you relax it, then do you lose this drop? Yes. So one direction that we're thinking about right now is to allow some distortion. But this one is an exact, so it's zero distortion. Okay? However, we allow some probability of failure, and we want that problem to small. All right, so it turns out that the greedy algorithm 
a Reed algorithm solve the problem. So here's the algorithm. You take your n reads of length L. The idea is that you merge these reads together to form so-called content, which are longer consecutive segments. Okay? And you set the initial set of contexts as the read. You find two contexts with the largest possible overlap in this sense, and then merge them together into a new context. You apply this process recursively until you get only one content. This is pretty natural algorithm. It will be the first thing that anyone can think of in the first 15 minutes or 5, 10 minutes. And what we show is that this algorithm is the one that does the job. Okay. So, the one way to think about this problem is that this algorithm progresses in stages. Okay? So that at stage L minus 1, we are merging reads which have overlapped L minus 1, and then we finish with all these mergers of length L minus 1, and then we go to L minus 2. Okay? Okay, so let's see how this greedy algorithm performs, and let's try to understand why, given those two necessary conditions, this algorithm actually works. So we're now, in the beginning, we're now looking at very big mergers. Okay? So you should enjoy this animation because this animation took a lot of my student time. <laughs> Instead of proving theorem, they do these animations for me. And you should enjoy it. Okay. Alright. So that's one lesson. You, you should, you, I always want to get students who can do theorems. That's very important. But they should also be able to do a PowerPoint animation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, what's a bad event? What well, a bad event is when you have two reads with two L minus one segments, which are repeat of each other, and then you merge it by mistake because instead of merging to your neighbor, you merge to some guy far away. That's no good. Reconstruction fails. So, a necessary, a sufficient condition for failure would be when you have a repeat of length L minus 1. Okay? Now, it turns out when you do the calculation for the IID model, is that when you have one repeat of this form, you will also get many repeats as well. Okay? If you do the calculation, you will see that once you get to a situation where you have one repeat, you will have several of them. And then when there are several of them, they are kind of randomly located with respect to each other. And with a significant probability, they will interleave. But we know that there is no interleave repeat because that was a necessary condition. And therefore, there is no these repeat as well. So the greedy algorithm goes through fine at the first stage. Now, let's go to stage L. So stage L, okay, we're talking about merging of overlap a little L. Okay? Now, well, you give a repeat of length little L then it seems that you'll get in, in trouble, right? But actually not. And here's the reason why. You, if you have an L repeat, you'll be in trouble if at the same time, each copy is not bridged by a read. What does bridging by a read mean? A bridging by a read means that you have a read which goes from one side of the repeat to another side. I claim that if this does not happen, then it will happen. Because if it happens, if this purple things happen, what will happen? You have a Gordon Gate bridge, which goes through it. Pop the animation here. <laughs> what will happen here? Is that this thing will have been already merged into this content because the greedy algorithm goes for larger overlap first. And therefore this content would have been longer, and therefore this repeat won't be at the end points of the content, and therefore won't cause confusion. In other words, this thing will be protected by the longer read, by the, by the read with the longer overlap, by the bridging. So therefore, you make a mistake only when this happens. Okay? So, how do you analyze this problem then? Well, let's go to Shannon. Shannon tells us, let's just try to analyze the typical number of such unbridged repeat. That's what we're going to analyze. We're going to look at how many repeats there are, and then look at how many of them are unbridged. And then basically, if it's very small, then we're safe. If it's very large, we're not safe. And information theory tells us that uh, something is either very small or very large. It's never somewhere in the middle. Okay? All right. So that's what happens. 
Uh, so it turns out that when little l is l minus 1, the number of unpushed repeats is precisely just the number of repeats. Why? Because if you let l minus 1, then you cannot get any bridging, because the bridge is only in capital L. So that reduces back to the first condition. So we're fine. Now what happens if these repeats are length 1, the other extreme? Well, if they're length 1, you will get many, many repeats. In fact, right, you're asking, is there A here? Then of course there's another A here. So you have many, many repeats. So the bridging condition is essentially a condition of coverage. That is, you want to cover essentially most of your DNA sequence. And that was fine too, because we have coverage. So therefore, based on those two necessary conditions, the last stage of the algorithm, stage one, and the first stage, which is stage L minus one, are both fine. What happens in the middle? It turns out the worst case always occurs at the last stage in the first stage. So this is the benefit of asymptotic thinking, typical thinking. That is, the worst case only occurs at one stage, turns out always the first and last stage. So we're fine. Okay. So in my remaining time, I think I want to do something which I think is important in this field, which is to look at some data. So I'll spend five minutes doing that. I'm done. Okay? So here's the question I want to answer. So we proved this very nice data. I thought it was pretty nice because it is a very simple curve and I like simple answers to questions. And there's two clear regimes here, repeat limited. So this part is you're limited by repeat, this part you're limited by coverage. Okay? So, some people may say, okay, you get a nice answer, but so what? I don't care about your ID model. Nobody cares about ID model. So, does it work for actual data? So, let's look at the answer. Okay. So, as Ogisa already mentioned, memorial DNA has many long repeats. Somehow, nature, evolution, loves to repeat stuff. Okay, cloning stuff. Because of these long repeats, the ID model is not very good. So here are two questions. How will the greedy outcome perform for general DNA statistics? And is it optimal so that you can get a clean decomposition into two regions? Are there a clean decomposition or is it a much more complicated picture? So that's what we are find, trying to find out. So if you return to the analysis we did for the greedy outcome, actually the dependency on the ID model is very minimal. Because what we were doing was that we were counting the number of repeats, like number of red pair, orange pair, purple pair, green pair. So in this example, there are four pairs of repeats. So we just basically counted them, and then we count what's the fraction of them are unbridged. But the unbridged process is basically a function of the read arrival process, and that's independent of the content of the DNA sequence. So therefore, the key number is really just the typical number of the repeats itself. So this is something you can measure from an actual DNA sequence. You go and look at the DNA sequence, you measure the number of L repeats for each L, and then you would do the analysis again, you would do the analysis again, then it turns out that the rate of the greedy outcome is given by this optimization problem. Okay, capital L is a read length, little l is the length of the repeat, L repeat, and number of L repeat log is the denominator. And there's an optimization problem here. Why? Because I'm looking at the worst case, right? Over the stages. And the minimization gives me the worst case. In the ID model, the worst case always happens in the first stage or the last stage. For arbitrary data, I don't know where the worst case occurs. But nevertheless, we can derive an expression like this for for general data. So now you give me a DNA, I can actually do a measure test and compute this number. So now we are sort of measuring. Okay, so chromosome 22 is the first chromosome we started with. Okay, this is built 37, so chromosomes, there are many versions of that. That's one, the latest version. G is 35 million, so this is a very short chromosome. This is one of the shortest chromosomes. Okay. I'm plotting the important number here, which is the log of the number of repeats, okay, as a function of L, okay, L is the length of the repeat, so this tells me 
how many repeats there are in the log scale. So the red line is what will be predicted by ID model. So I measure the marginal statistics that I extrapolate using ID model. This will give me the red line. And the data is the blue line. Whoa! Guys, ID model is not that at all. Look at the fit. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, all right. I've cheated a little bit here <laughs> because I look at only a very short L here. So let's look at a bit longer L. So now I'm looking at L up to 16, 15. Okay, bad news, folks. The data is deviating from the IID model. So here are where the long repeats start emerging significantly. So the IID model is predicting very few of these. They're starting to come. <laughs> this is totally bad news. Totally bad news. And uh, so this is the problem when you look at data. So uh, Sergio said, Sergio said uh, uh, um, Shannon looked at data and he got some good insights, but there's a flip side. When you look at data, it may completely contradict your theory. And that's the problem. So here's the problem we have here. So it turns out that this is the actual curve. Okay? And for a larger scale, you can even see more. And actually, there's a very long repeat here at about 2,300. Okay? So we have a problem, but nevertheless, we're going to force ahead here. And we're going to use this blue curve to stack it into this formula and compute what is the really outcome rate. Okay. So, hold and behold, there's something interesting very ha happening here. Is that although our model really sucks, however, what is predicted by our model is that you have a critical threshold followed by the coverage line is exactly happening in reality, at least for chromosome 22. Okay. However, the threshold is now much longer than what is predicted by the ID model. The threshold is way up here. So the threshold has been revised. But the quantum shape of the situation is the same. Okay? Um, and we have the longest repeat. Okay? Um, and it turns out that for this particular data, the upper bound that you can calculate using our technique matches the low bound quite well with only a very small gap. So the greedy outcome is actually quite optimal here. Okay, so to avoid forced advertisement, I want to show one more chromosome, 19, which have very similar behavior, but it turns out that now our upper bound and the greedy outcome has a pretty big gap. Pretty big gap. So this is to show you that the greedy outcome is actually not universally optimal, okay, but actually, uh, more work has to be done to close the gap. But you can see now that with a framework, we can draw these curves, we can look at data, and now we can have a systematic way of getting better and better outcomes. So we're eventually hoping that we can find an algorithm where these two curves match. So going back to the computational question that Vanka raised, is that, uh, so how about the complexity? It turns out that the general problem, you think about it as a worst case problem, give, give me an arbitrary set of reads for reconstruction, is empty hall. Okay? It turns out though that the greedy algorithm that we're using can be implemented in time linear in the number of reads. Okay, so a naive implementation will be n squared, but if you can use some more sophisticated structure like um, suffix tree, and that will cut down the complexity quite a bit. Okay? So, and it seems to perform well in quite a few cases. So that's kind of surprising. And actually, I must say that Shen's philosophy about information first and then complexity actually seems to have some bearing on this problem as well. Okay. Uh, I should make one mention here, which is a confusion that we get often when we talk about this stuff. Is that, hey, isn't there some result? Actually, this slide is actually for a boss. But our boss is actually <laughs> okay, alright. <laughs> uh, what he showed, you can tell him out over lunch perhaps. <laughs> what he showed is that there's a problem called the shortest common superstring problem, where if you give me some string of length L to read, and the ID independently chosen from read to read, and you put together into a superstring, the greedy outcome is actually optimal for that problem. That's, the problem. That's what he showed, very nice result. But guys, our result is totally different. Why? Because if you look at our result, we are looking at an ID random string, the master string, and then we extract the reads. 
But because we're cutting on the overlap between the risk that we construct, the risks themselves are highly correlated because they overlap. So a totally different problem. But by coincidence, at least for the IND case, our really algorithm is also optimal as well. Okay, so let me finish. I have a lot of stuff to tell you, but I can talk offline to people interested. So let me just conclude. Okay, so information theory is a great deal. It has made a huge com com impact on communication. It focuses on something fundamental, information. And what I want to argue here is that this philosophy may be useful for other important engineering problems. And I'll give you one example today. Okay, thank you.